طيب مساء الخير Good evening, welcome to you ladies and gentlemen. This uh, session post lunch uh, is perhaps difficult, but I do have uh, two panelists uh, who will be talking about uh, a hot kind of issue, the relationship between Iran and the GCC. It is a, a convoluted relationship, as we know. This session is entitled uh, Iran and the GCC. We have two speakers. Uh, Mr. Abdul Rasul uh, Defsala, who will be talking about the militarization of Iran's perception of Saudi threat, implications for regional security building, and uh, the second speaker who is a prominent uh, lecturer in Qatar Mr. Mahjoub Azwari who will be talking about uh, the Iranian GCC relationship uh, following a year of uh, the election of uh, Mr. Raisi navigating murky waters uh, our first speaker is uh, Abdul Rasul uh, Dev Sala he is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute in Washington and a visiting professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the University Cattolica del Sacro Cori in Milan. He co-founded the Regional Security Initiative at the Middle East Directions Program of the Robert Choman Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. In his role, he led a combined research and dialogues project on rethinking the security architecture in the Gulf region and work closely with the EU institutions on this matter. The gentleman has worked extensively on Iranian defense and security policy, great power politics in the Middle East, international security in the Gulf, and uh, he is uh, a co-editor of Stepping Away from the Abyss, a gradual approach towards uh, a new security system in the Gulf in 2022 and he has published nine other books and dozens of papers in top international journals. Dr. Mahjoub Azwari is the director of Gulf Studies Center and professor of contemporary history and politics of the Middle East at Qatar University where he was the head of humanities department up until 2016. Before joining Qatar University, Mr. Zawiri was a senior researcher in the Middle East politics and Iran at the Center for Strategic Studies at University of Jordan. And uh, he was a research fellow and a director of the Center for Iranian Studies uh, in the Institute for Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at Durham University. Zawiri has more than 80 publications uh, in the area of Iran and contemporary Middle East uh, history and politics. Uh, please. Uh, We'll start with Mr. Abdul Rasul. And as I said, uh, his paper is entitled The Militarization of Iran's Perception of Saudi Threat Implications for Regional Security Building. 20 minutes. Yes, please go ahead. Shukran Jazilan. Uh, thanks to Arab Center, Dr. Mehran Kamrava, and all of you uh, gathering today here for this uh, discussion. Uh, well, uh, today we'll talk from something which is um, like the JCPOA, an ongoing discussion between Iran and Saudi Arabia behind the scenes, of course, and uh, that has caused many discussions that how really the state of relation is. Uh, you know, um, I think all of you uh, have heard a lot about many discussions uh, regarding how Saudi Arabia sees uh, Iranian threat and what are the major um, threat perceptions that Saudi Arabia has toward Iran. Um, I think a lot of papers, discussions, policy reports uh, have uh, elaborated the Saudi perspective to Iranian threat, uh, which um, you know starts from uh, Iran's regional presence, its, its intervention in uh, the Arab um, domestic political uh, factors or destabilization of the region, as uh, some of them are calling, and many more that uh, elaborate the Saudi's perspective. But what I think. Uh, basically lacks uh, in this discussion is how basically Iranians are seeing the Saudi threat. 
uh, because by not going into this discussion and referring it to some sort of uh, Iran's um, you know, somehow ideological aspirations or hegemonic aspirations, I think we will face with some sort of simplification of, uh, of the complexity of the bilateral relations. And overlooking the strategic assessment behind Iranian moves in the region uh, might not help us in order to uh, move toward building a kind of uh, more peaceful or cooperative regional security in the region. So that's why I think this is a paramount question that how Iran sees the Saudi threat and whether the Raisi government uh, and his administration uh, is able to change that threat perception. Because when we talk about many of Iran's regional policies and, and uh, its presence in the region, it's basically uh, decided on the basis of somehow uh, domestic consensus among, uh, let's say, military security complexes in Iran and follows, um, of course, part of it follows some revolutionary aspirations, but more importantly, it has strategic assessments behind that. And so the question is critical, whether the Raisi government can change that or not. Uh, I, I will uh, explain today that I think the Iran's threat perception regarding Saudi Arabia has undergone a major shift, at least in um, post-2015, 2016 period. You know, traditionally, Iran-Saudi relation was defined based on their political rivalry, a kind of a balancing act between uh, the two actors, a kind of a desire to keep each other checked in, in key confrontations in the region, and um, blocking each other from gaining some sort of uh, political upper hand. But uh, interestingly, both countries, because of various reasons, from having some sort of um, leadership that was able to talk to, uh, let's say, um, internal domestic reasons, both uh, refrain from moving toward a very direct military uh, type of threat perception. Uh, it's right that many may argue that, of, at least from Saudi perspective, Iran has become a direct military threat to Saudi Arabia since the, uh, its intervention in, so in, in Syria and even before uh, in Iraq. But the point is that, um, like it or not like it, for Iranians, for many years, Saudi Arabia was not a key issue to deal with. Iran's deterrence uh, policy, or let's say its military doctrine, was focused on US threat and then on Israeli threat. So somehow, there was a kind of uh, um, downgrading process, a sort of downgrading process of, of Saudi's capabilities and power from the Iranian mindset. So in Iran's strategic thinking, Saudi Arabia was not seen as a major regional power that can threaten Iran in any way. Uh, however, my argument is that this is or has completely changed, or it is changing, and Iran is looking at Saudi Arabia in a completely different way. That's why um, the prospects of these talks today and how uh, the Raisi administration is capable to change this dynamic is very much a critical question that re uh, requires a better analysis. Um, well, why I think Iran is, has changed its perception towards Saudi Arabia? Uh, I think four reasons contributed to this uh, new Iranian threat perception. Uh, first and foremost is, uh, let's say, the change of the leadership uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, MBS actually, uh, Ben Salman's open hostility position toward Iran was interestingly a new uh, way of uh, looking at Iran by Saudi leadership. The fact that uh, brought animosity, a kind of a political rivalry that we were always talking, to a, some sort of a personal problem with Iranian leadership. When he called, when he started to calling Iranian leadership as uh, comparing it to Hitler, and uh, an evil force in the region, the problem and the rivalry become very much personalized. I think we should not under, underestimate the fact that we're in a region that uh, uh, elites and, and leaderships uh, have an important personal dimension in their decisions. This is a fact, again, in the Saudi-Iran relation, looking at uh, Rafsanjani period, the success of Rafsanjani period was his personal relation with, with the kingdoms 
um, um, elites at that time. However, what Ben Salman started to do was somehow reversing this process and put himself as a kind of um, a direct uh, open threat toward Iran. So this first dynamic actually was not just on the level of Rio Theric. It, it was followed by some certain and clear policy recommendations by Saudi Arabia in the post-2015 uh, JCPOA period, which was uh, Saudi, a coordinated Saudi Israeli lobbying against JCPOA. We should not forget that JCPOA for Iran uh, was similarly, as President Rouhani at that time mentioned many times, it was, it was an economic policy, but it was also security-wise important because it was a process of desecuritizing Iran in international world order. So it was the, one of the most important foreign policy projects of, of post-revolutionary Iran that Saudi Arabia and Israel jointly tried to block it. So this new reotheric and open hostility measure was very much uh, um, accompanied by some certain policy uh, recommendation. It never stopped at the level of reotheric. The second factor was um, which is, I think, is important to consider, and usually is, again, underestimated, is Iran's gradual assessment about the change of a balance of power in the region, Iran's perception of aggregate uh, of, of Saudi power. Well, we know that Saudis were quite smart and good in, uh, in the way that they invested their oil revenues. They were able to generate a lot of money, their vision 2030, uh, 2030 uh, is quite ambitious, doesn't matter whether it takes place or not, but it projected an image about Saudi Arabia, about a rising power, and the way more smartly Saudis started to use their financial and, and capital capacity uh, to counter Iran uh, was a major signal, I think, in Tehran, well received, that there is a risk of a change in the aggregation of power in the pro proximate future. And this is accompanied by uh, a counter uh, power policy by Saudis. What I mean is that Saudis in parallel started to uh, take some um, well, very calculated measures uh, to um, reduce or let's say um, downgrade the, the possibility of Iran's economic growth, which of course the objection toward the JCB was one of them. So this is what in Iranian uh, literature of uh, strategic studies, usually in Tehran, it's called uh, Saudi uh, economic war against Iran. So this perception just tells that how Tehran is seeing Saudi's economic policy towards, uh, towards itself, a kind of war. This is important that that Iranians call Saudi policy uh, way back to 2015, 2016, and 2017 as an economic war. So this combination of building up its own power while a, a very active policy in order to, uh, to coerce Iranian economic uh, capability is where basically, and we, we, you know, we are in a region that I think re region balance of power still dominates the mentality of the people. Uh, so, and, and Iranians are quite sensitive about any shift or change in the balance of the power. This has contributed to the fact, this was, of course, not just stopped in the military level, it moved toward uh, the power projection capabilities in the military side. You know, we had the, the highest level of, let's say, inequality between spending on military or military budget in 2016. The whole GCC spent $113 billion while Il Iran alone $12 billion. Well, I know the counter arguments well when uh, Saudi uh, scholars argue that, look, you know, yes, Iranians have the capability, they're working better, they're, they're smarter in Syria. Uh, yeah, right, but, but when you put yourself in the Ministry of Defense in Tehran and you look at the numbers and you see that your rival probably is spending 10 times the aggregate more than you, probably you start getting a bit nervous and seeing so what we should do. Uh, well, of course, in 2021, the numbers have changed a bit while, you know, because of the Iran's uh, decision to increase its military expenditure and while Saudi's decision to reduce its military expenditure, so it becomes 55 for Saudis while 24 for Iran. But in any sense, uh, this inequality in the spending and in the desire to 
uh, grow of military power uh, contributes to this dynamic. The third factor, which I think is quite important, is a kind of a regional alliance, which of course was mentioned somehow in the, uh, Dr. Musavian's discussion today in the morning, uh, to contain Iran uh, in the region. Uh, well, while I agree uh, with some experts that technically there are a lot of obstacles in order to create a unified Arab force against Iran because of many reasons, including the trust deficit in the region between the, the Arab states themselves, but uh, the idea that uh, and the continuous presence of this idea from the Arab NATO to Mesa uh, to now uh, the post-President uh, Biden visit to Saudi Arabia, which the U.S. statement, official statement, uh, pledges the U.S. Um, uh, promises, the U.S. presence uh, and, and security assistance to Saudi Arabia to have a more integrated air and missile defense. Well, uh, wh many experts argue that, well, technically, Saudis are not going to share their missile defense codes with Qataris. Qataris are not going to give them to, to Emirates, where we, we know all these technical issues, but uh, the strategic signal that goes from uh, these, uh, let's say, trends uh, are very much taken seriously in Tehran. And I think uh, Iran is gradually realizing that maybe that's not the uh, possibility in the next two years, but it is the possibility in the next 10 years that Iran is going to face uh, with a more coordinated uh, defensive capability by the Arab states uh, in the Persian Gulf. And that is where, uh, uh, well, the, the, this concept of Iran's threat perception is, is impacting by these assessments. Well, uh, I, I think at the same time, three factors were influential in this move toward, um, which are not going to change in the near future about uh, this more unified Arab uh, power against Iran, and that's about the, the, the U.S. disengagement from the region, the, let's say, the, 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 the Israel's um, uh, introduction into the CENTCOM, which is a quite a, an important technical development in the sense that is bringing Israel, which for decades been the major military threat to Iran, close to the Arab uh, states. Well, we, we put this uh, close to the statements by uh, Ben Salman that, uh, well, um, Saudi Arabia and Israel share about the Iranian threat. Um, then we have the, the issue of um, the third, fourth factor, uh, fourth factor contributing to Iran's threat perception, and that change uh, is about the, the policy of um, destabilizing Iran's internal affairs. When I know this is very controversial, and there is a great tendency against, again to overlook at it, but that's a reality that Saudi Arabia has a very active public policy regarding Iran. Uh, there, Saudi Arabia's public policy is advanced. Uh, it m uses a lot of different and expanded tools, and it is supported by uh, by by sufficient resources to to project and, and let that public policy go ahead. Which, to name it, you know, we have those who are following Iran issues are very much aware of the fact that now there are a couple of TV news channels websites from independent Farsi to Iran International to many other uh, TV channels and, and outlets that basically are the, uh, the contributors of this Saudi Arabia public, uh, public uh, let's say, policy. Uh, the, the other aspect on the same category is the fact that I think it's very, very much well known that uh, those who need funding for for example, studying Iran, they can always have some funding from Saudi Arabia to study Iran. But the way of studying Iran that, of course, uh, is, is, is aligned with that narrative. So these all, uh, let's say, uh, m motivations or, or, or desire of, of Saudi Arabia to, to get into the domestic policy of, policy of Iran or intervening in Iran's domestic policy is something that has growingly uh, been an issue in Tehran and has been uh, revisited in various different ways. So these four elements, uh, which I just say them once again, that the change in the leadership in Saudi Arabia, the possible change of the aggregate of, of, of power and then regional balance of the power, 
the more active Saudi Arabia public policy and the possibility of the regional alliance defensive, I'm not arguing about offensive capability in the regional dimension against Iran, but this defensive capability are the four power, uh, four elements that I think is pushing Iranians to argue that, look, uh, it's correct that we still have Saudi Arabia not as our main military threat, we are still going to fight with, with US and, and Israel probably, but there is a high possibility that the third country that we need to be prepared for fight with it uh, is Saudi Arabia. This perception was never existing in Iran's uh, strategic thinking uh, in early 2000 and neither in early 2010 or until 2015. Uh, there are many signs uh, when I argue this. Uh, for example, um, there, there is a growing um, following think tanks in Tehran and the number of publications, the number of theses, the number of uh, research demanded by, uh, let's say, security organizations, by IRGC, by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, by National Security Council, Supreme National Security Council, you realize that Saudi Arabia has become a prioritized issue of uh, study. Well, thank you, I have three minutes. Well, uh, this is one, f one factor, I mean, uh, contributing to this argument that, that understanding Saudi Arabia as a possible threat uh, is increasing. That's a show that Saudi Arabia is no more the Saudi Arabia that Iran was using to see it as, as a junior power in the region that is not capable to fight with Iran. Now Iran is seeing Saudi Arabia as a real threat that is able to possibly start a war with Iran, maybe not in a direct way, but at least when there is a scenario of, for example, Israeli counter uh, preventive strike on Iran's nuclear capability, Saudi Arabia might be part of that plan. So they need to be a containment strategy for it. But there is also growing um, um, agreement um, among Iranian experts inside Tehran that Saudi Arabia should be contained and Iran's main tools for containing Saudi Arabia is its military capabilities. Here comes, for example, the issue of Yemen, uh, where Yemen, uh, against many of those experts arguing that Yemen is a low-hanging fruit issue for Tehran, so it's, which Iran has not spent that, that much on Yemen, so it's ready to make more concessions in Yemen. I think it's opposite, actually. Tehran uh, see Yemen as a strategic uh, way to contain and to control Saudi Arabia unless otherwise the whole strategic landscape of relations change. And finally, I think uh, the situation might become uh, more uh, critical if uh, both countries uh, will remain incapable uh, to bring their discussions into, uh, let's say, military and security-wise issues. So I conclude my, uh, my point by saying that uh, I, I think one of the evidences of my argument is that the recent talk, Saudi-Iran talks, has started at a security level. That means that both countries see each other as security military problem rather than a political problem. The issue between Saudi Arabia and Iran is more uh, a kind of a security and military threat that is threatening the both countries' existential uh, existence of the political uh, system. So um, I, I hope that the talks would uh, somehow led to some at least, um, well, the good news of today about the, 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 the going of Emirati ambassador in the coming days to Tehran is a, is a very positive sign. And I really hope that both countries will, will engage in a type of discussion, in a type, type of a more security defense discussion to reverse this, this, this trend. However, um, the, the realities on the ground and uh, the, the, the realities on the ground are not uh, so promising in, in, in uh, pushing both sides toward a kind of a serious security and defense uh, talks. But I, 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 I wish that the beginning of the political relation uh, would be a beginning for also a more serious discussion. So I stop here and hope I can uh, engage more on questions. Dr. حدثنا عن تغير النظرة الإيرانية تجاه السعودية أنتقل الآن إلى متحدثنا 
الثاني في هذه الجلسة الدكتور محجوب الزويري هذه هذا paper is entitled Navigating Murky Waters Iranian Gulf Relations a year into uh, Rais's presidency thank you very much first of all please allow me to thank Dr. Mahran the Arab Center and his team at the Iranian Studies Unit for their kind invitation. Uh, my paper was prepared jointly with Ms. Lean. She is with me. I thank her for her contribution in preparing this paper. And she has uh, arrived back from the States today. The, she is still uh, suffering from jet lag. Uh, she is a Georgetown University graduate. And uh, we always give credit to our young people or young graduates who participate in this kind of uh, research. Uh, talking about uh, the Raisi term makes me uh, talk about uh, the personality of Raisi. Raisi is the second personality after Khamenei, who is uh, the product of the traditional conservative uh, school of thought in Iran, who was not concerned with foreign affairs. He was within the judiciary. He is from within the political system, its system and the judicial system in Iran. Also, as a religious personality, he has uh, his position within the religious establishment, and therefore he he knows the inner details of the system from this point of view, but he does not necessarily understand or know about foreign affairs at the same level. The second thing which can be said about Ibrahim Raisi, that if there was no American withdrawal in 2018 from the 2015 nuclear deal, I don't think Ibrahim Raisi would have become president. I think what brought Pres uh, Raisi to the presidency and made him the favorite choice for the establishment was the American withdrawal from the nuclear deal. And uh, uh, observers always uh, focus on uh, this period. After 2018, Iran used to suffer because of political pressures, economic pressures, a sense of anger at the popular level. The gap between the political establishment and public opinion was increasing. There was criticism even within, from within the system of the regime itself. So therefore, the choice of a personality, which is to lead the country, for this reason, Raisi became one of the favorites because at the internal level, he is not known to be corrupt, although may, some may disagree with that. And at the international level, uh, the regime does not care much about what's said. He may have been a member of the death squads or whatever, but what matters to the regime is to defend its presence uh, its survival and rid itself of uh, the dangers constituted by the American departure from the nuclear deal. For this reason, right from the start, uh, it was obvious that he had some momentum behind him. Some may argue that uh, Ahmadinejad was a favorite. Uh, he, he is not. Uh, the number one favorite is a university lecturer who was brought into the scene after the 
Khatami period because he is a populist figure. If you listen to Raisi, he is not a populist the same way Ahmadinejad was when he used to tell the Iranian people that I bring the oil revenues to your dining table or something. Rafsanjani was a first class uh, personality in, in when it comes to economics. Uh, Khamenei or others said they used to go to him to borrow money from him when they were in financial needs. For this reason, Raisi is an important development and it's important uh, to view him in this light as an important uh, turning point in the way the regime chooses the figures that it presents to people to gain the public support. Raisi came to power facing a number of challenges the American withdrawal from the nuclear deal, uh, the Azerbaijan crisis in Iraq, the political trend which supports Iran was defeated in elections, and Taliban winning the Afghanistan war. Some people may say that Iran is used to these things. What bothers Iran and what frightens Iran is the timing of crisis. Iran is very skillful in choosing the timing. If they do so, then it's perfect. If the crisis imposed on them, it will be a problem. In Ar Azerbaijan and Armenia, the crisis was imposed on them. In Afghanistan, the crisis was imposed on them. And all these became items on your agenda. They started fearing refugees from Afghanistan. They feared the way the Taliban government would behave. Their political uh, extensions in Pakistan are not safe in so far as it And uh, I, I would link some issues to a future point, what I'm talking about Currently, all these crises land on the president's desk. He wants to build on what the previous president has started by way of an initiative to ease tension with the neighbors. He wants to calm the people, the audience inside because of their disgruntlement with the way the regime has been dealing with the economic situation, and he wants to, to ob observe all these things, take all these things into account, and at the same time deal with the outside threats. He tried to ease tension with the Taliban. Iran appointed to uh, two, two personalities were appointed who are close to Iran, and uh, uh, Iran became more or less confident that uh, no trouble will be brought into Iran's doorstep from Afghanistan. Uh, in Iraq, however, the situation was different. The problem has not ended. And the fact that Muqtada al-Sadr goes as far as saying the marja'iyya, the, the religious uh, figures who are like the, the, the reference to Shia people should be Arabs. Why should people turn to Iran or something? Definitely this kind of... Uh, narrative is bound to raise concerns in Tehran. In Iraq, there is a state which is all, almost uh, a failed state, and they, Iran pushed on Iraq to regain... Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Iran manages to uh, 
regain five billion of the oil revenues, but in Iraq the situation is different. When there was when there was uh, over seventy members of parliament belonging to the Sadrist uh, uh, the, uh, trend, no member of parliament which belongs to the Iran camp attended any sessions of the parliament. As Sadr understood that as Iran placing obstacles in his way to form a government. For this reason, there is a real crisis in Iran. Nur al-Maliki said, and I quote, unquote, Iraq lost with this Qasem Soleimani's death a prominent figure. Soleimani had the tools to communicate with different political forces and powers, and he managed to communicate with them, coordinate with them, influence them. Nobody is able to do that. For this reason, Nuri al-Maliki has been viciously attacking al-Sadr. So therefore, everything, everything al-Sadr does nowadays is directly very clearly and obviously to al-Maliki and Hadi al-Amri. And in my opinion, this crisis in Iraq will be perpetrated and there will be, there is no end in sight. And this reminds me of the situation in the Lebanon and everybody knows what was happening in the Lebanon. Iraq, at the same time, having been through this crisis, still despite that, the mediator between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So Iran is placing Iraq in this awkward situation and yet expecting from Iraq to play a mediating role. Of course, Saudi Arabia has executed 41 Shia persons and considered, is Iran considered that uh, an act against Iran. Although uh, Raisi, Raisi's position was relatively moderate and some news agencies like France and others uh, applied pressure on the, on the president to say something more critical and for this reason, for this reason uh, to the mediation efforts with Iraq have been brought into a halt. I think Iran didn't want that. They didn't want to criticize the execution of over 40 Shia figures in Saudi Arabia. All of this happens in the shadow of uh, the attempt to restore the nuclear deal. Uh, Ibrahim Raisi's gate into foreign affairs is to solve the dilemma of the nuclear deal. You cannot mend fences with the, your neighbors at a time where there's an, a crisis like the nuclear deal going on. So if Iran cannot solve its problems abroad, how can the neighboring countries solve their problems with Iran? And, uh, and at the level of the Gulf countries, there are different uh, degrees or levels of relationship. Bahrain has bad relations, Oman has good relations, and the Saudi-Iranian relations are, of, of course, very tense. There is some quick points I'd like to mention here that uh, Saudi Arabia's relation with Iran before Ibrahim Raisi with uh, Mohammed bin Salman coming to power uh, has changed things. The nature of the political change in Saudi Arabia has turned Saudi Arabia for the first time constituting a threat uh, in the perception of Iran. Secondly, Saudi Arabia does not deal with Iran within the context of, the, of its relations with America. They deal with Iran on the basis of the regional context, regardless of the situation with the 
with America. I think this is a very noticeable thing. Uh, uh, the Saudis are saying to the Iranians, don't look at us from the lens of America. We are independent in our thinking. Ibrahim Raisi left Iran on state visits. He went to Oman, he came to Doha, he exchanged messages. There is more or less some period of calm. Hassan Rouhani was not interested in the Gulf compared to Ibrahim Raisi. Even the security initiative, which was proposed by Hassan Rouhani, was, oh, was no more than lip service to the issue and not a real attempt. But Ibrahim Raisi wants that kind of initiative. And in my opinion, this uh, refers me to an article I wrote in 2021 in Middle East Eye. What helped Ibrahim Raisi is the year 2021 was the year of buying time. Everybody uh, came out of the year 2020 exhausted because of the corona crisis and everybody was trying to buy time. Iran benefited from this atmosphere and specifically Ibrahim Raisi's presidency. Everybody wanted to calm the situation in Lebanon, Iraq and elsewhere. Nobody wanted confrontation. There were, despite what was happening in Iraq, there was no attempt to uh, interfere, really. Uh, there were uh, many parties were observing things, but not interfering in an obvious way. As for Ibrahim Raisi's relation to, with Turkey, and now we move to the Syrian question, Ibrahim Raisi adopted the choice by the official establishment, uh, which is the best way in dealing with the Syrian uh, question, is to choose the Asitana and Suchi tracks, and Iran is uh, uh, walking along this this path and. It's as if Ibrahim Raisi is saying, this is the choice of the establishment, and I'm following suit. As regarding uh, uh, Iran's uh, fears about, uh, about security operations inside Turkey, I think Turkey got in touch with, with, with Iran and told them in no uncertain terms that there is no way any targeting of the Israelis or anything else can be tolerated on our soil. For this reason, the chief of security for the revolutionary guards in Iran was sacked. Finally, one year into the Raisi presidency, uh, any breakthrough in solving the nuclear deal will open some open the door for some hope for the Raisi uh, residency. And we should not forget that Iran took one of the most important uh, decisions by signing a long-term contract with the, for 25 years with the, uh, the Russian uh, uh, petrol gas company and uh, imagine what uh, what what the reaction of total or british uh, petroleum will be uh, th th these these companies will not be involved with iran if the nuclear deal is restored of course the rapid developments in the ukrainian crisis uh, makes Russia want to benefit from Iran, even if at the political and economic level only and nothing more. Uh, Raisi started his presidency with crises. There is no indication that this uh, uh, crisis will end soon. I think he'll have to chart his way through this sea of rapid developments regardless. Thank you.
thank you, Dr. Mahjoub, for this uh, invaluable intervention. You've talked about the challenges uh, Ibrahim Raisi has encountered and shall encounter. We have <coughs> half an hour to receive your questions uh, and to answer them. Yes, please. If you could introduce yourself first, please, and then pose the question. Amjad Jibril, a Palestinian researcher. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, the panelists, uh, the three panelists. There are two, actually. Yes, the two panelists and the moderator. I would like to ask uh, a few questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Rasul did great uh, in his uh, intervention, and he's been realistic, uh, and I've enjoyed his intervention. If we talk about uh, conservatism, will your analysis be different? I'll rephrase the question. Will Saudi Arabia and Iran lose uh, this uh, regional struggle? They both, both, two of them, especially when it comes to Yemen, because some say that uh, Iran shall lose and Saudi Arabia as well. And Dr. Zwiri has uh, 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 touched upon Iraq as well. In addition to that, uh, uh, from our perspective, I think, uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia is building a vision. Mohammed Salman is uh, uh, rebuilding the identity of Saudi Arabia so that it can be co-equal when it comes to Iran and Israel. What's surprising is that Mohammed bin Salman is leaning perhaps towards Israel and is being bellicose when it comes to Iran. So this is what we call about uh, what we call the, the, the social kind of structuralism, whereby he wants uh, to entrench the Saudi identity to be opposing Iran uh, rather than uh, the relationship to be amicable. Thank you. Another question? Shukran jazilan. Great contribution of uh, both panelists. Uh, I, my question is uh, about uh, uh, what Dr. Deep Salar uh, presented. You highly, uh, you you highlighted the uh, importance of personal relationship between uh, regional powers, namely Saudi Arabia and Iran in this case. Uh, however, when we look at the trajectory of ups and downs between the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran from the like bloody Hajj event in 1987, I believe, to the very, very warm relationship, as you mentioned, during uh, 1990s, during uh, Rafsanjani and uh, Khatami, and again, what we have on plate today, actually, which is not, which was not started from. Mohammed bin Salman, I think that was the late years of uh, Abdullah bin Aziz's reign when the uh, relationship between two countries deteriorated. Uh, how would you evaluate the uh, weight and the importance of the power vacuum in Iraq in early 2000 as a critical juncture or turning point in, this, uh, in, the, in the relationship between two countries? So uh, shall we give more way to this exogenous uh, factor created by U.S. invasion to, I to Iraq more than maybe personal relationship or traditional uh, routes between uh, two regimes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Marwan. Thank you, Dr. Marwan. Thank you, Dr. Marwan. 
we know that the struggle between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran since 1979 has been uh, over religious legitimacy and uh, influence in the region. But we see that Mohammed Bisman kind of took a uh, new perspective on Saudi religious establishment. So I would like to take your, your take on how that would reflect on Saudi political discourse towards Iran and in turn the relations between the two countries. Thank you so much. Shukran, Akhjama. Haakhud Sual, Akhir, Burja, Jolitania, and Asila. My question is about uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia. Uh, do you think, Mr. De Salar, that uh, the question is the competition between two regional states. When uh, Richard Nixon came to the Persian Gulf in 73 uh, about building uh, uh, two gendarmes for the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran was a winner in the beginning. And now, as you said, Saudi Arabia is stronger now and the two gendarmes are more or less equal. And the question is not a direct confrontation, military confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, war is nonsense war, but competition for regional power and influence in the, in the, in the region much more than a military uh, competition. So the soft power of Iran is today maybe much more important for Saudi, the danger, in quote, for Saudi Arabia than military threat of Iran. A, a nuclear bomb will never fall down on Jeddah, but uh, 85 million Iranian with the experience they have of uh, political Islam and uh, uh, an opening to the, to, the, to the modernity could be a major challenge even for Saudi Arabia in the program of 2013. We shall answer the questions uh, and uh, then we might take uh, uh, another set of questions. Uh, actually, let me mix because there are some things uh, that I think I can respond together. Uh, on the issue of um, the first question, the fact that will they both lose, I think yes, um, they, they will both lose if the, the competition between Saudi and Iran continues. I think the key um, actor who gains is, is Israel here because actually Israelis have been successfully managed to cover the Israeli-Palestinian issue, which uh, at least in the Arab world is, is still uh, a critical remaining problem uh, toward uh, building a regional security architecture in the, uh, in the region, uh, this topic is now hidden behind the Iranian threat. So the Iranian threat and the concept that, uh, well, look, you know, this is Iran that is uh, at the top of the uh, problem in the region is, is creating a large space for Israel to maneuver. Uh, and, and that's um, that's a strategic gain. So definitely, Iran um, and and uh, Saudi are both losers. And and if they cannot manage to to somehow calm down their tensions, I think that's the outcome uh, from their competition. Uh, well, um, on the second question uh, about the fact that uh, uh, the role of uh, um, person personality and if a critical juncture could be in 2000. I think no. Uh, I, I, I was, based on my personal experience, I was there in Iran's Ministry of Defense at that time uh, when Iran's decision about uh, going toward uh, Iraq and later its actions in Iraq was there. Uh, that was basically a main reason for uh, countering possible U.S. threat. Uh, as I said, for many years, Iran was not seeing at all Saudi Arabia as a possible threat. Uh, in Iran's strategic thinking, Saudi Arabia has never been a big, with all re due respect, uh, this is part of Iran's strategic culture, uh, the fact that the Iranians see themselves somehow superior over the, their Arab neighbors. And uh, they, they were not considering Saudi Arabia as a, as a major power, uh, as a major threat that they need to draw a strategy to counter them. The threat was U.S., the possible uh, access of evil, result of access of evil that could have become uh, an, an, a logic to strike Iran. And, and going to Iraq uh, was seen, this is a, I, I made it a lot in two major papers. Um, I discussed the fact that how Iran's strategic logic at that time worked. This was a simple logic of the fact that 
you have some resources, you have some, historically you have been able to create some resources in the region, type of proxies or whatever you call. Uh, your missile forces at that time is not so uh, capable to, uh, to prevent possible U.S. strike. Iran was only relying on its own strategic depth. It means that bringing the adversary inside and make it a coercive war for adversaries, so raising the cost and prevent the strike. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the links and the opportunity that, that rised in 2003 and 2004 to use those links in Iraq and elsewhere in the region to raise the cost of a possible U.S. operation was the logic behind the Iranian action. Uh, of course, I understand that this, is some, this was the main strate strategic mistake of Iran when it comes to the fact that it overestimated the Saudi threat perception, the fact that Iran's presence in, in Iraq could lead to the Saudi misperception that this is the, a kind of, of course, uh, a kind of a hegemonic perception or whatever that Iran is taking control of all over the region, and the lack of a communication between the two, two countries that led to this discussion. This is where I think the future direction of talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia should go. Should go they, they need to talk about their threat presence. They need to talk about their military doctrines. Some people in between Riyadh and Tehran should start sit together and say, look, you know, what is the threat perception that we are seeing? We are here to, def to, to prevent a possible st Israeli strike or U.S. strike or what? To take the Arab lands? Uh, this, is, this needs to be clear. The problem is that you don't have a clear document from the Iranian side telling you what is your objective. So people can have the, their own perception that what is your objective. So I don't see 2000. 2000 or even Iran's intervention in Syria in 2011-12 as a critical juncture for Iran-Saudi relation from the Iranian perspective. So even in, even in Syria, Iran was faced with a critical decision to intervene or not intervene based on the fact that not intervention in Syria could have led to losing uh, the Iran's strategic depth and, and create the, the threat of Israel uh, toward Iran. So that decision very much was picked up by Saudi Arabia as a direct threat uh, to Saudi Arabia and led to the uh, round of, let's say, action and reaction processes that, uh, that caused us to be here. And then uh, the question that asked about the, how the deal reflects uh, the JCPOA in Iran-Saudi, um, I'm not r honestly so optimistic about the fact that these two uh, can be so much directly connected to could be connected. Of course, it's right that the JCPOA can create a kind of a positive environment uh, and can, uh, can create a political space for possible regional talks, but because the strategic, as I tried to explain, the strategic source of the problem between Iran and Saudi Arabia are somehow diverse and are different from the JCPOA track, uh, the hope over uh, JCPOA as a reason of of uh, reducing tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia might be overstated. Even the role of President Raisi, there, there was a whole message of my discussion, that the role of President Raisi uh, is limited here. President Raisi can put some, imp can, can give some inputs in Iran's strategic thinking regarding the need to build relation with, with neighbors and so on and so on, but it's just one voice among uh, the Supreme National Security Council, and among many other stakeholders in Iran, in Tehran's decision-making uh, process, uh, which has lots of actors. Um, so uh, I, I don't think that uh, we, we, we can so directly, but despite the, the fact that it, JCPOA can create a momentum that, if politically used correctly, can lead to the next stage of, uh, next stage of regional security building, but JCPOA by itself, it's only a uh, um, crisis prevention strategy only on the nuclear file. It, it does not, it was not intended to link, to be linked to the regional issue, to the missile issue or, or Iran's regional policy. So um, I, I, honestly, I didn't get so much your question about soft power, but um, yeah, right, I, I agree with you that part of, part of the problem with, uh, with, um, with the uh, Iran-Saudi issue on both sides uh, is their perception of their own soft power as a reason of intervention into their domestic uh, factors. Uh, this is uh, something that 
for Saudis has become a, a major issue, that Iran is using its soft power to intervene and to, I mean, uh, which partly is right if you look how Iran operates in, in Syria, for example, and in Iraq. Uh, Iran has been managed to, for example, with 6,000 expeditionary forces, create the huge presence in Syria. So this was based on its uh, skillful use of soft power plus measured economic project, economic and, and people to people connections. So yes, that's a soft power. This is something that uh, the Americans uh, fail, or are continuing to fail in, in Syria. Uh, when they want to do something. So, well, that tells a lot about Iran's soft power and the, and the fact that it can be threatful if it really there is a strategic thing behind it. But I also agree that uh, there is an ideological element here and that is probably the most dangerous part from the Saudi perspective. And that's the fact of exporting Iran's revolution, you know, as, as a kind of, kind of a policy that, that very much threatening uh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran. Uh, Dr. Mahjou. I just, um, yeah, I have a question, but the idea that says uh, the Saudi-Iranian uh, relationship is uh, solely linked to the perception is uh, somewhat. Uh, a reduction to the whole matter. I think uh, that uh, the two countries uh, think uh, that they are better and they are bigger and they are more prominent in the Islamic world. Uh, the two countries uh, think of themselves uh, as leaders. So the issue has nothing to do with uh, the economic uh, interests per se, but the perception amongst the Muslims, amongst the Arabs and so on, Saudi Arabia in the past uh, used to say that uh, we represent uh, the Sunni Islam, the majority, and Iran uh, thought uh, that uh, uh, it was also <coughs> the Mecca of the Shia. And uh, this struggle is still there. This is the essence of the problem. Perhaps uh, since uh, uh, King Abdullah, uh, things have uh, somewhat changed. Saudi Arabia uh, resorted to define the uh, national interests. So when the national interest uh, has become more refined, the uh, issue of uh, the struggle with Iran uh, has been uh, kind of uh, more uh, entrenched. So Saudi Arabia at the time worked against Iran in Afghanistan, in Balochistan, in the southern part of uh, 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 Pakistan, supporting the uh, Iranian opposition uh, abroad, uh, and uh, uh, working against Iran in Dubai, and so on and so forth. Uh, so Saudi Arabia had uh, certain activities uh, that were opposing uh, uh, Iran. But um, uh, in the past, Saudi Arabia thought uh, that everybody loves us. Uh, we are the Sunni majority. We don't care when it comes to Iran, and so on and so forth. But Saudi Arabia has refined its uh, national interest uh, lately. Iran did so uh, in the past uh, as well, before even Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Any further questions? We saw we have a few moments. Salam alaikum. Saaradu. Any theoretical model for addressing the threat perception issue in the Gulf, and especially with regard to Iran and the Gulf countries? What I understand is that uh, this region is so extraordinary that uh, perhaps uh, the normal th th perceptions, for example, between India and Pakistan or other countries, we can treat these th third perceptions uh, as normal. But here we have uh, extraordinary third perception in which not just one country is source of threat, but also the many sources and unpredictable. So there are only, only two case studies can be. One is Israel, which has a specific third perception from Arabs, and then it's Iran. 
So how do you see that uh, in such extraordinary situation, there is peace or stability possible? We need, uh, I mean, uh, if you could uh, comment on this uh, issue, as uh, is there is possibility of a theoretical model on this issue? طيب شكرا في اسئله ثانيه تفضل بس انا في موضوع فيما يتعلق التصور هذا احيانا تصور الثالث ينظر looked at the third perception is looked at as if it's something not realistic it's outside the reality in the 40 years or so of uh, the Islamic uh, revolution in Iran history that the, the this is uh, more of a threat perception based on policies I think uh, uh, Jack Straw's book is important uh, uh, I read the book and apparently there was a lot of uh, collaboration between Iran and Israel and uh, at the level of weapons or intelligence during the Iran-Iraq war. I think the threat perception is not just uh, illusions or delusions. I think this is more of uh, a reality. And maybe we should look at it as uh, a lot of things have been said about threat percep and perceptions. Good afternoon. Daniel Gahtani from Kuwait. Uh, I belong to a generation which witnessed the disturbances between both the banks of the Gulf and we suffered directly from Iranian uh, violence. Two weeks ago, we celebrated the 38th anniversary of Iranian organizations causing explosions uh, in uh, cafes in, in Kuwait. We understand in Kuwait that geography cannot change, but the problem is uh, uh, trust between the two sides uh, is not there and it may never be there and we we cannot uh, view the this uh, Iranian way of or narrative well, like the Iranian foreign ministry uh, or foreign minister speaks of relations with the neighbors as reminding people of the saying by the prophet that your neighbor comes before your house and forgetting that Iran is already has incursions into four Arab countries. The Iranians have this uh, way of uh, looking in a condescending way. They view the Saudis or the Arab people as ignorant people and uh, etc etc i think um, maybe there should be some sort of a security organization in in the gulf and this is something which is talked about by both sides Uh, my name is George Petrov from the Bulgarian Embassy in Doha. Uh, my question is regarding the Saudi Arabia-Iran rivalry in Yemen. How do you see the development of, uh, of the situation there? More towards a political resolution now when they have the, the new presidential council or more like a rivalry that we seen in the beginning of this uh, year in Marib? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try and divide the time equally between the two panelists. The question when we talk about 
threat perception. There is no perception which is not supported by narratives on the ground. For example, we, we cannot say that the Saudis in Riyadh are dreaming about uh, Iranians and the Iranians do the same about the Saudis without anything happening. There is hundreds of evidence testifying to both sides doing something to irritate uh, the other. For example, uh, for this reason, the mediation or dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran started from a security point of view. If they had anything political to uh, rely on, they would have done so. So therefore, the example between Saudi Arabia and Iran is obvious because it's obvious that both countries have reached uh, a level of uh, irritation towards each other. And when I was uh, when I was talking in Saudi Arabia once uh, from a point of view of objectivity and the scientific methodology, they did they didn't like it. The Saudis didn't like it because uh, they are they they are basing their emotions or anger. For, for example, that the, uh, in, there was dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but the media interfered and forced it to stop for two months. What both sides should understand that if the Saudis and Iranians wanted uh, a kind of lasting relations between them, they must determine their interests and accept that there are some fundamental differences. Otherwise, they'll continue this love-hate relationship. In Yemen, I think the Saudis are doing what the UAD did, and that is withdrawing gradually. For example, uh, the presidential council and the gradual withdrawal and and the Yemen is likely to be an even more of a failed state, relying more on, uh, on aid from outside without having a real government and having two political uh, rival political entities, one in the north, one in the south. Finally, I don't think Iran is concerned with making the decision makers understand the political discourse, the steps they take, and the narrative they adopt are the things which are capable of creating a, a good positive atmosphere or a positive atmosphere. Because this, after all, after all will determine it's true that Arab countries fear Iran, but what consolidated this fear is Iranian intervention and uh, Iranian discourse. Uh, Oman kept its relations with Iran since 1980. In 1980, this is uh, uh, something which was told to me personally. This, they said, they said. They said to the, to the Iranians plainly, do not ever interfere in our internal affairs. We have Shias, we have Sunnis, just keep your hands to yourselves and don't interfere in our affairs. A man can accept that, but a country like Saudi Arabia cannot accept having relations with Iran without Iran giving something in return. If Iran is prepared to give concessions to the West and to America and the Europeans to reach a nuclear deal, aren't the neighboring Arab countries worthy of such concessions too for uh, both actually, sides? Uh, I think, um, let me start with uh, uh, one point about um, a true uh, narrative or points that uh, my Kuwaiti brother said. Yes, 
I think we need to accept that the Iranians did a lot of mistake in their policies. That's obvious. If, I mean, it, it, this is not a, um, a, a correct policy observation if we say it was just all the Saudis' fault. Um, Iranians were ignorant at the beginning of the revolution about what they're doing in their uh, neighboring countries. Uh, they continued that ignorance, they underestimated. As I said, there are uh, issues in the strategy culture that Iran should read critically about it. It's a self-reflection, uh, self-criticism of itself, uh, and that's one process internally that Iran should go over it. But when it comes to um, the region, um, but, but that doesn't explain that the Saudi side were where someone that have not done the same things, as I explained in my explanation. But w the question that you mentioned that how we can start this process, I agree that the situation and threat perception that we have in this region is very particular, very different, for example, from the case of uh, Europe in the Cold War, that you had uh, international order, uh, threat perception was basically a military threat perception, strategic threat perception, all instruments of power were not securitized. Here in this region, all <coughs> instruments of power are securitized. You have threat perception from cultural level, at the economic level, at the military level, at the political level, and even at the environmental level. So uh, we, we are facing with a complex threat environment, and as a, res and as a result, you know, the organizations who are defining these threat perceptions, like for example, if you look at in Iran, if you see different organization, you have a threat perception of Saudi economic issue from the Ministry of Economy. You have the threat perception of the Saudi uh, military capabilities from the Ministry of Defense. You have a threat perception of the Saudi cultural issue from the Ministry of uh, Culture. So it's a complex of threat perception in the Iranian side, in Saudi side. So how are we going to start? That's a very difficult question I think the people were not being able to answer so far. That's why we are here on the policy academic. Uh, we have in the uh, European University Institute done some research. Dr. Uh, Mahjoub himself contributed a chapter. We tried to explain that what should be those uh, beginning phases of that. I think, uh, I believe that the first thing is that both sides should realize that both are doing mistake. They cannot go for maximalistic demands of asking the other side to dropping its security policies that has been working for years. For example, Iranians cannot start asking Saudis to not counter, counting on uh, U.S. Um, as a security guarantor. U.S. should leave the region. That's not a realistic policy because then how Saudi's uh, strategic vacuum should be responded. Or the same way Saudis cannot ask to change Iran's missile program or regional presence because Iran's whole military structure and doctrine is based on its missile drone capabilities, missile capabilities and regime. So you cannot start by, by questioning the whole structure of the other side's security policy. First stage is a measurement, as a measured, calculated series of confidence building measures, which luckily we have seen in this round of a talk, as I said before, between Saudi and Iran, which is started from the security organization, but that can only be effective if it continued and both sides start to better understand their threat perception and move based on their uh, correct understanding of threat perception, sequence of actions, a kind of a great gradual steps toward uh, building a, um, security cooperation in the region. Shukran. Thank طيب. you. Shukran, uh, Thank you. I think we are five minutes uh, more than the time allocated to us. Maybe this is justified when we're discussing a question or a crisis which is going on for over 40 years and has impacted the lives of almost everybody in the region. And some of these uh, crises are becoming even more complicated, whether we're talking about Iran or the Arabian Peninsula or other challenges faced by the region. In order to achieve the kind of development that everybody 
as possible, but it seems that we are we're into more of the same. We hope there will be change. There were a, there was a time when in the second half of the nineties where relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran looked very positive after a period of tense uh, problems in the 80s, after what happened during the pilgrimage, the Hajj incidents and the attacks on embassies, etc. We hope that this time around they can achieve something positive. Thank you to both our panelists and thank you to our audience and those who participated. In the dialogue, we start after 10 minutes. Thank you.